copyrighted program transcribed and dedicated to the prevention of crime. Calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 202 at 127 West 42nd Street, 127 West 42 Street. This is the fire department arson squad. That is all, Gordon. of many a peaceful citizen has been disturbed and his return to consciousness harrowed by hearing the cry of fire. Small fires may spread beyond control and result in a citywide disaster, accompanied by a horrible toll of life and property. Arson, the setting of fires, is a felony and a peculiarly contemptible form of crime. It is rarely committed except for gain, the collection of insurance, though sometimes the arsonist is urged only by revenge or an attempt to cover up another crime. Of course, the fire department of any city is responsible for the control and extinguishing of fires. But where arson is suspected as the genesis of the fire, there the police department steps in, accompanied by the fire marshal. The arsonist is a cunning creature. He hopes that the fire will destroy the evidence which started it. To circumvent this, the police department and the fire department must and do work hand in hand. How well they do is shown in Sirens in the Night. Engine Company 22, acting Captain Moeller speaking. You've got a fire at 127 West 42nd Street. Okay. It's the go. It's 127 West 42nd Street, right. Yep. 127 West 42nd Street. Okay, 127 West 42nd Street. Let's go.
Louie, I see. Well, I came over as soon as I got your call. Had a little trouble last night, I understand. Yes, but I don't understand. I've taken every precaution to keep that place free of fire hazards, and still it caught fire. Wiring all right? As far as we can find out, everything was in order. I'll tell you what I think. I believe the place was set on fire. Any idea who might have done it? None. Now, wait a minute. Huh? Maybe the family that lived there before had something to do with it. Where are they now? Well, I don't know. But I had a little trouble with them about the rent. And I wouldn't be surprised if they had something to do with this. Better be careful, Mr. Barton. Arson's a serious charge and one practically impossible to prove. Yeah? Why so? Well, in the first place, usually all traces of evidence are destroyed. And unless a man is seen in the actual act of setting fire to a place, it's practically impossible to prove that he did it. Well, I never realized that. How you'd be surprised at the number of fires that are incendiary. But isn't it risky? Sell them for the man setting the place of fire. Unless he uses explosives or some highly volatile substance like gasoline. But the greatest danger is to innocent persons living in the quarters or nearby buildings. They're the ones who usually suffer most. Well, that must cost you insurance companies a lot of money. It does, but it costs you a lot, too. What do you mean by that? High insurance rates. Why, I don't pay much for my insurance. That's what you think. As a matter of fact, you pay some form of insurance premium with every purchase you make. Hmm, I hadn't thought of that. Oh, neither do these fellows who burn down their houses to collect insurance. They think they're getting by with something. Well, I'd like to catch the bird who set fire to my place. Well, we'll turn this over to our investigators and to the fire department arson squad. If he's still around, they'll catch him. I hope so. I wouldn't want him coming back and finishing up the job. Now, don't worry about that. We'll keep an eye on the place, and if he tries it again, we'll nab him. Well, that'll be fine. Oh, uh, by the way, when do I get my check for this fire? Oh, I'll, I'll send it over this afternoon, just as soon as the adjusters look the place over. Good. I've got some notes coming to you and some other property, and I want to be able to clear them up. I'll get on that right away. We'll also get after your fireball. But though investigators worked for weeks on the case, no trace of the firebug was found. The insurance check was duly paid, the property repaired, and new tenants found for the house on West 42nd Street. Phew, what a job. What a job. This was the dustiest place I ever walked into. What would you expect after being vacant six months? Uh -huh, I know. Mrs. Thompson says this is a jinx house. Who's Mrs. Thompson? Well, she lives next door. She said this place has been vacant ever since it was built. She's crazy. It was rented early this year. Yes, I know, but she says nobody would live here after that man set it afire. What man? Oh, that's just it. Nobody knows who did it. But they know somebody set it afire because he didn't like Mr. Barton. If he had as much trouble getting his lease settled as I did, I don't blame him. <laughs> I think Mr. Barton's nice. I'm glad you think so. He sounded like he wanted me to cancel my lease before I moved in. We aren't in yet. No, but we will be by tomorrow morning. You know, Mrs. Thompson says Mr. Barton had a chance to rent the house for more than we're paying. When was this? Just yesterday. And so that's why he doesn't want us to move in. Well, I'll fool him. I'll move in tonight. Oh, but how can we? That window's not fixed, and the place isn't yeah, clean, and... Never mind. I'll fix the window myself if I have to, and we'll clean up the place later. I positively will not move into this place until it's clean. You'll move in tonight. Mrs. Thompson Once said Once and that... for all, I don't care what Mrs. Thompson said. We're moving in tonight. Barton will fix that window, at least he said he would, and if he doesn't... Well, we move in tonight. All right, but August, don't shout at me. I've heard so much about this jinx and Mrs. Thompson and fire. But I didn't mean Stop it. Stop it, will you? Let's go now. We've got to load the furniture and get back here before night. All right, August. All right. I won't mention the fire again. Yes, but I tell you, good. there's I've something... In a bar room on Whittier Boulevard, two men are talking. Good afternoon, Mr. Barton. How are you, Albert? How's things going? Oh, six, two, and even. Have a good Christmas? Well, not very good. You know, being on the county and all... Yes, I, I know. Things have been a little tight this year. A little tight, huh? Been more than a little tight for me. Honest, looks like I never will be able to pay you back what you've done for me. Oh, don't worry about it. Yeah, but I do. Well, maybe you'll be able to do me a favor someday. A favor? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Hey, if I ever can, just let me know. I'll do that, Albert. Well, what do you have today, Mr. Barton? Uh, let's see now. I think I'll have a glass of beer. Glass of beer, yes, sir. Anything to eat? 
Well, maybe you'd better bring me a Swiss cheese sandwich and Russian rye. We sound a Russian. Right away. And there's your beer. Oh, thanks. Quite a hit on it. <laughs> Creamy. I thought you liked it that way. <laughs> That's good beer. Yeah. Hey, how'd you like to make a little money, Albert? Money? That's what I said. All the things I want to have to do for it. Well, I've got a job you could do for me. That is? Yeah. You could make 10 or $15 dollars at it. 10 or $15? That's eh? right. What doing? What time do you get through work here? Oh, in about a half hour. A half hour, eh? I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll drive you out and show you the job. Well, if you want it, I'll make the necessary arrangements. Sure. I'd like to look it over. I think you can take care of it all right. Nice-looking place. Yeah. Been a jinx house, though. A jinx house? Honest? How so? Well, I can't seem to keep it rented. It's been vacant ever since I had that fire last year. That long? <laughs> Looks like the place had just been cleaned up. Yeah. I rented it yesterday to a fellow named Dube. He got another offer of money less than an hour after that. But Dube wouldn't cancel his lease. Is that the job you want me to do? Well, part of it. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? <laughs> Haunt your place. No. <laughs> uh, uh, what is it? If I'm going to do the job, we better get started. Yeah, I guess we had. Well, you'll find a cane in the back there. Here in the car? Yeah, in the luggage trunk. Oh, back here. Oh, yeah, that's it. Bring that in, will you? Sure. Better be careful with it. Sure. I've got a hole plugged up with a match and a piece of rag. Yeah, I'll watch it. Oh, gosh, this is heavy. Hey, careful, don't spill it. Oh, I won't. <laughs> Where do you want me to put it? Uh, right on the back porch. Okay. Just inside the door there. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll tend to it later. Okay. Hey, what is it for? Termite? Yeah, another pet. <laughs> okay. Hey, hey, wait, wait now, wait. I'll come back and help you with that wind in a minute. You go ahead and get everything fixed up. I'll do this job, and then I'll look over what you've got done. Yeah. Do it just like I told you now. Oh, sure, sure. I'll do a good job, all right. That's what I want. A good job. At 34 minutes past 7 o'clock on the evening of December 29th, 1934, August Dube walks into the fire station at 4352 South Main Street, asks to see the officer in charge. I'm acting Captain Moeller. What can I do for you? My name's Dube. I just rented a house at 127 West 42nd Street, and something suspicious has happened there. What do you call suspicious? Well, in the first place, that house is a jinx house. There's been fires there without any ordinary explanation. Now, the neighbors have been telling all sorts of stories about the place, but I never paid much attention to them. But this afternoon, when I went back to take a load of furniture, I noticed a very peculiar odor. Like oil or kerosene or something. In the house? Yes, sir. I noticed that there were some oil stains on the walls up near the ceiling, like it had seeped through the plaster. Were they there when you rented the place? That's the funny part of it. The house was in good condition, except for the dirt. And uh, you never noticed the odor or the stains before this evening? No, sir. My wife and I worked in the place all morning, and when we left, the place was spotless. When we came back, the stains were there. Hmm. Do you know whether or not anybody was around the place after you left? No, I don't. And, uh, you say there's been a fire there before? Yes, and no one seems to know what caused it. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Well, Mr. Dube, I'll, uh, I'll send the man over with you to look the place over and see what we can find out. Oh, uh, Oliver. Yes, sir? Change your clothes. Get into some civilian clothes and go with Mr. Dube here and look his place over. Phone me if you find anything that looks suspicious. Yes, sir. Now, Mr. Dube... You just go right ahead and act as though you hadn't noticed a thing. If we find the fire is planned for that address, well, you can take it from me. We'll take care of the bird who's planning it. And 
Engine Company, 22, Moeller. I looked over that house on 42nd Street. It's a plant, all right. How's the layout? There's at least five gallons of oil poured around the attic. Beginning to seep through under the floors now. A lot of papers scattered around in the attic. Seen anybody around there? Nope, not at all. Well, stick around. I'll notify the chief. Sounds like a job for the arson boys. When they get there, you can come on in. Okay, Captain. Yes, hello? I want to speak to Chief Battalion 4. One moment, please. Chief Battalion 4. Oh, Chief, this is Acting Captain Moeller, Engine Company 22. We've found what appears to be an arson plant at 127 West 42nd Street. Uh, who reported it? The tenant who's moving in there. I've got a man watching the place now. He says there's a great deal of oil and kerosene around the place. Well, I'll notify the investigators right away. You keep your man on the job till they get there. Have your company stand by in case anything happens. We want to prevent a fire if possible, but be ready for a call in case the bug slips past our men. All right, Chief. We'll stand by. Battalion Chief Boone notified investigators Hare and Schubert of suspicious conditions at the address Moller had given him. The two men make a thorough search of the place, finding a well-laid plan for a fire. Failing to find any igniting device and realizing that the firebug plans to set the fire himself, Schubert leaves to get fire department photographers so as to obtain pictorial evidence. Air calls investigator Harris to assist him in staking out the house. Schubert and I went over the joint with a fine-tooth comb, but we couldn't find anything that looked like an igniter. Ooh. Coming back to do the job himself, is he? Well, that's what we figured. Say, isn't this the same place we looked over last year? Yes. We were sent out to check up an insurance claim, remember? Yeah, sure I do. I thought that fire was set, too. Mm, so did I, but we couldn't find anything to prove it. Well, looks like we've got him with the goods on him this time. Yes, if he shows up. With that much oil in that place, we've got to get him before he sets it off. You're telling me. Who owns that place? A chap by the name of Barton. Barton. Mm -hmm. Didn't we pick up a couple of birds who had a grudge against him while we were on that last fire? Yes, yes, we couldn't get anything on them, though. Oh, oh boy, he must have a flock of enemies. Like somebody's out to get even tonight. Hey, wait a minute. Look there. Hmm? There's a car stopping in front of the house. Yeah. Maybe that's our man. Looks like he's having a little trouble parking that jalopy. Bit under the weather, if you ask me. Yeah. He's our man. I'll bet on it. Now he's going around the back. Hmm. Hey, come on. Hmm. All right, now you take that side. I'll go around to the right here. See him anywhere? No, don't. Went back of those palm trees, though, I think. I'll meet you in the back. Okay. See anything? No, not yet. I wonder where he went. Maybe he didn't come in here at all. Hey, wait a minute. Somebody just struck a match. Where? On the back porch there. Oh, yeah. yeah I see it now. Let's take him. He whiz. Two ladies, set it off. Yeah, there he comes, grab him. Uh, I'll get him. You turn in the alarm. Take care of our friends. All right. All right, stick him up. Uh, I said stick him up. Uh, Don't uh, try to run when I tell uh, you to stop. Uh, I never done nothing wrong, uh, mister. I, I had to do it. I, I, I had to do it. I, I all tried. right, all right, all right. We'll find out about uh, that later. Now, tell me, how much oil did you put in there? Five gallons. Five gallons? Yeah. Well, come on, get away from here before more of it goes uh, up. Honest, mister, I didn't mean to do it. Honest, I All right, I never mind I... about that now, will yeah. you? Come on. Captain? Yep, we've got all the top fires out, but I'm leaving a man here to watch for fresh outbreaks. How much damage did it do? Oh, not much. Less than a thousand dollars, I'd say. 
Well, if this bird hadn't given us the slip tonight, we'd have prevented all of it. Well, if we could catch them all before they got any further than this one, we'd be satisfied. Yeah. I'll return in a report on this. I'll see you later. Uh, he, he, he made me. Who's he? Uh, I ain't going to tell you. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, no, I ain't. Uh, what's your name? Uh, Albert. Where do you work? Oh, I got a part-time job in a saloon out on Whittier Boulevard. What do you do with the rest of your time? Well, whatever I can get to do. Such as setting houses on fire, eh? Uh, no, no, this is the only job I ever did. Oh. Did somebody hire you to do this job? Well, uh, yes and no. Yes and no. Just what do you mean by that? Yes and no. I, I mean, uh, well, I I owed this fellow some money, and uh, I thought I could sort of square myself with him if I done this. Who is he? I ain't gonna tell you. You realize, of course, don't you, that we can send you to jail for this? Yeah, uh, I don't care. How much money you owe this fellow? Oh, a uh, couple of hundred. Maybe less. Maybe more. Uh, what do you owe him that much for? Well, uh, he's been letting me take five bucks every now and then. Did he offer to cancel the debt if you did this job? Well, uh, he didn't say. Does the guy who hired you to set fire to this house know the man who owns it? Wait. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I guess he does. Has he got a grudge against him? Huh? Uh, I don't know. Have you? Me? No. Now, listen, Albert. If you're trying to hide something to shield somebody, you're just wasting your time as well as ours. You're going to jail anyway. Now, come on. Come on clean. Tell us who hired you. I tell you, nobody hired me. I did it. Just to do a friend of mine a favor. Mm -hmm. Well, how did you go about it? Well, a friend of mine, he told me that uh, he could get even with a fella. Make him do something he, he wanted him to do if uh, this place caught on fire. And he told me he'd call things square if I'd do the job. Oh, he did. Just where did you get the kerosene and the oil? The kerosene and the oil? Oh, uh, he bought it at a filling station down on the corner on Main. And we come up here. Uh, the people that had rented the place uh, had just left, and I had a key to the back door. I don't know where he got it, but... Uh, I went in and got a table up under the scuttle hole there and uh, climbed up in the attic. Uh, he handed me the oil and the newspapers, and I scattered them around. Why didn't you do the job then? It was daylight, Jane. We didn't want nobody to see us. I see. And then what did you do? We drove out to where I work, and I hung around there a while. And got drunk. Well, <laughs> just a little, maybe. Needed a little more courage, was that it? Well, I guess so. You say this man had lent you money over a long period of time? Yeah. How much? Oh, maybe a couple of hundred bucks. Were you going to get any more for doing this job? Huh? Yeah, fifteen dollars. Mighty little money for the risk you took. Yeah. What's coming up here? Why, Errol, what are you doing here? Why, I, you, uh, uh... know this man? Certainly I, I know this man. I've known him for years. Yes, Mr. Buck, Over a I, long uh, period uh, of time? Uh, yes, for probably two or three years now. Just who are you, by the way? Why, I'm the owner of this house. Barton's the name. Oh. Yes, Mr. Barton. I remember you now. You had a fire here last year, didn't you? Why, yes, I did. How did you know? I'm Investigator Hare, Fire Department Arson Squad. Arson Squad? Why, what, who... And I'm I, Captain Harris of the same department. What are you doing here? We caught this man setting fire to this house, Mr. Barton. What? Setting fire to your house, Mr. Barton. Well, what's the meaning of this, Well, you see... Have you, have you lent this man money? Why, yes, but... How uh, much money have you lent him altogether, I mean? Why, I'd say a hundred, maybe two hundred dollars. Did he ever pay any of it back? No. Did you expect him to? What? Did you expect him to pay it back? Why, why yes, of course, certainly. Well, how? I, I beg your pardon? How did you expect him to pay it back? I, I don't follow you. I... Perhaps I can make it plainer. How did you expect an unemployed man to repay a loan of $200? Well, it really wasn't $200. It was... Oh, uh, whatever the amount. How did you expect him to pay you back? Well, I, I hadn't thought about it. Are you in the habit of lending money that way? I don't think I am. Don't I... you know? What? what? Wait. Why, no, I'm not. It's rather warm tonight in here, isn't it, Mr. Barton? Yes. You've noticed it too, have you? Do you know the penalty for burning property for insurance? What's that? I said, do you know the penalty for burning insured property? Well, what's that to me? This is your property, isn't it? Certainly. And it's insured, isn't it? Naturally. And it's been burned, hasn't it? I still don't Mr. See... Barton, I think we'd better explain to you that you're under arrest for conspiring to create an incendiary fire. Oh, this is preposterous. Do you know who I am? Yes, Mr. Barton, we do now. You're a fellow that goes around burning his property in order to collect the insurance. You tried that several times before this. 
We couldn't pin it on you. We've got you now, though, red-handed. I'll have you dismissed from the department for this. You have no proof to connect me with this fire. That's what I thought, too, until you got so warm a few moments ago and pulled out your handkerchief. Oh, what's my handkerchief got to do with it? Uh, may I see it for a moment, please? Well, certainly. Here. Thank you. You see, we found a five-gallon can out on the back porch. It had been full of kerosene just recently. It had a little air hole in the top of the can, too. Somebody had plugged that air hole with a match wrapped with cloth. That piece of cloth, Mr. Barton, came from the corner of your handkerchief right here. Do you see? All right. All right, I see. And that's why we're arresting you for burning insured property. I didn't think about that plug. Yeah, evidently not. Tell me, did you set fire to this house before? I said, did you set fire to this house before? Yes. Yes, I did. Why? Why? I'll tell you why. All my life, I was a home of my own for my family. And I couldn't afford one. But finally, I saved enough money from my job and I bought a house. But it caught fire. The insurance company said I set it on fire. And they wouldn't pay me. But I didn't. I didn't, I tell you. Right then, I made up my mind I'd get another house. And I'd insure it for every dollar it would stand. And then I'd burn it. I'd show them. They'd pay me the next time. Well, I did it. I did it and it worked. I stood there watching the flames mount higher and higher, and I heard them roar. Those flames meant money to me, plenty of money. I did it again and again and again. And I wanted to see those flames burn into the soul of the insurance company as they seared mine when I watched my first house burn down. That's why I did it. And I'd do it again. I'd do it again, I tell you. I'd do it again. <laughs> Two men accused of the crime of arson in the case you have just heard duly appeared for trial. They pleaded guilty, thus saving the authorities the cost and time of trial and were then sentenced to prison terms. The shrewd, able, untiring investigators of this felony, Harris, Schubert and Hare, deserve a great deal of credit for their work. They did not lose sight of the fact that the defendants in this case had certain rights, but neither did they lose sight of the fact that a criminal must be punished. It is their work which proves that crime does not pay. (laughs) Thank you.